We don't know his name, but we know him as Lucifer. On the day he was created, God anointed him top angel. He was the most beautiful, he was the most powerful, he was the most wise creature. Earth was Eden. It was God's garden, not Adam's. And this garden was a jeweled earth, and it was sparkling with minerals everywhere you looked. And in this garden, Lucifer was placed as the creator's prime minister. He spoke for God as a prophet speaks for God. He received worship in all its forms from the portion of the universe that was placed under him, and he offered it to his creator above him as a priest. And he ruled and he governed for God as a king. He administered God's perfect will blamelessly. And from his very first moment of conscious existence, he never saw better than himself except at the very throne of God. There was no evil in all of God's creation. Thus, no example of sin was ever set before him. Yet at some point, this being so taken with the authority and the worship that was passing through his hands, much like merchandise from the world and the portion of the world that was below him to God above, decided, since he was so wise and so beautiful and so powerful, that he could retain some of the worship for himself. But even more than that, that he could originate some of the authority in himself. And thus, this creature allowed his heart to be filled with the violence of rebellion. He had been entrusted with God's government, priesthood, and spokesmanship. But he wanted to act independently of God. This was the origin of the evil one, which, by the way, kills any idea of the eternal duality of good and evil. Mm. Lucifer was created. Thus, Satan and evil had definite beginnings, which means they shall have definite mm. ends. Yes. And so he thought, I, who am prophet and speaks for God, can I not give orders under my own authority? Instead of being wholly dependent upon God, I, who am so beautiful, magnificent, filled with power, can I not take some of the worship for myself? I deserve that. And here lies the origin of sin. A creature whose eyes got off the creator and onto self. Man began to take shape in his heart and in his mind of this creature. A five-point plan that he believed would absolutely ensure a reversal of the order of the universe, placing a creature on the throne and knocking the creator off the throne. And his plan involved securing a new position, a new power, a new prominence, a new perspective, and a new person. No longer number two, now becoming number one. And all creation will look to me, including the creator. And so he carried out his plans with a group of angels that were willing to accept his authority. Somehow communicated to the angels they were tested in their free will, with one-third of the angels agreeing to this angelic being's terms. And into the universe came a second will, which was the very first moment in time. You see, that's the difference between time and eternity. Eternity only has one will in existence, God's will, and all creation following that one will obediently. Time, however, has more than God's one will in existence, thus conflict. I can imagine what it must have been like, all of those 
angel was the third that decided to follow him. Well, what's the plan? How are we going to do it? You'll know. You'll know. When I reach for the throne, just follow me and give me support, and we will be on the throne together. And all of a sudden, in that very first moment of time, this creature, Lucifer, thrust himself upward and attempted a hostile takeover. But at that very moment, that very first moment in time, with two wills, with a simple word of God, this creature received his first mouthful of dust. As all of a sudden, the heavens and the earth were toppled in judgment, total chaos. The lights went out and the earth shook. It shifted, actually. And war was declared on this noxious enemy. Now, one must understand that this rebellion was not a request for God to kind of scoot over so that he could share the throne. No, this was rather a thrust at the creator himself, God himself, to put God out. And God's intervention in his creation, all of it, his answer to this attempted hostile takeover was to wreck it, to wreck his creation by a great catastrophe at the very moment that Lucifer made his bid for this power. That was God's answer to this rebellion, to ruin everything that he's ever made. And earth became a wreck and a ruin without form and void, waste and empty dark. The French Bible says it became topsy-turvy. And in the midst of the darkness, there lies this malignant enemy, this malignant creature with all his followers judged as well, realizing their eternal doom in the dark, feeling themselves, wait, uh -huh. I feel different. What's going on? Where's the Why can't we see? This is not what you said. What happened? What you promised us a promotion. This wasn't part of the plan. What are you going to do? How are you going to fix this? Look, look, what's going on? Nothing's working. My authority's gone. What's happened? All the while in this judged creature's mind is a slow awakening, a dawning of realization of just who he really is, a judged creature eternally. I can imagine that maybe even an attempt was made to make things right, and in his anger he stood up and cried, I'll let there be light! And there's nothing that happens, shrieking with all of his might, and nothing happens. Where had his power gone? What about his voice of authority? others watching him as he has lost all authority and they cannot believe it. I can imagine him trying to combine his authority with the voices of his forces that he had convinced to come with him and said, let's do it together on the count of three, one, two, three, let there be light! And there's nothing but darkness. There's nothing. Okay, let's turn to lesson five. Oh, that was good. Yeah. Oh, so good. You're so angry. I love it. It's like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask just one question? Because God is all knowing and all seeing. Did He know the change yes. in Lucifer over time? Did He know what would happen? Connected because Lucifer was connected, like Adam was connected to him, right? Did Not because He's connected, because God knows all things. God knows. Yes, yes. and we're going to do that. So now that's the story. Now I want to take you back, and I want to teach you line upon line, how this story is fit together in the Bible, okay? All right, so we've got up here a timeline that we're going to use. We're familiar with the timeline. So let's go to, like I said, at the top of your lesson, look at Lucifer. It says, Lucifer, Satan, the beginning of time, all right? You might want to draw this timeline, okay? What have we learned so far in this class? Well, when I said to turn to the beginning of the Bible a few weeks ago, remember how most people turn to Genesis 1-1? But what did we learn? We learned that the beginning of the Bible is where? John. It's exactly. It is in John, John, in, or John 1-1, excuse me. John 1-1. In the beginning was the 
Word. And who did we, we find out the Word was? Jesus. Jesus is the Word, and we know that He's eternal. Eterna, uh, eternity doesn't have a beginning or an end, right? right? Immortal has a beginning, right? Eternal doesn't. This timeline, this line right here with the arrows on, on both ends, that's a, 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 an eternal line, okay? This would not be an eternal line. Remember geometry, the days of geometry? Remember that? That is not a line of eternity. That would be a line of immortality. Correct? Because there's a definite beginning and then no end. Do you see the difference? Okay, good. So we know that that's not a picture. This one up here is not a picture of God or the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Right? And the Word was with God and the Word was was God. In other words, the word already existed before the beginning began, is basically what that is saying. We've established that. Okay, go on to number two. What do we know? So that's way back in eternity past. Now, what do we know then next? Well, we know that the angels at some point, I can't say a point in time because time had not yet begun. So I have to say at some point in eternity past, we know from Job 38 that the angels were created because it says there, where were you, Job, when I laid out the foundations of the earth as the angels sang and shouted for joy? So we know the angels were already there when the earth was being placed and, and, and put in its foundations, correct? Okay, good. All right, then, number three. The creation of heaven and earth now brings us to Genesis 1-1, which is right here. And I should probably use a different color, okay? Which brings us right here. The creation, I'm going to put H and E, the creation of, well, that's not really right. Well, yeah, it is. That, that's what we're going to say, because we're going to say this was the beginning, and the beginning was the word. And here, at some point in eternity, heaven and earth were created, right? And that's what Genesis 1 1 says. So let's turn our Bibles open to Genesis 1 1. And let's look at the very first sentence. A lot of people, they often will feel at the end of the year, especially if it's been a bad year, you know, about these whole, you know, New Year's resolutions, right? I'm going to read the Bible through, right? And on January 1, they, they're so pumped, ready to go, and they turn, and they begin with Genesis chapter 1. They say, this is great, and they read the first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and they go, wow, this is great. I'm so glad I'm doing this. I get it, <laughs> right? And then they go on to the next sentence, and they're like, wait, what? This is so hard. All right, now, I want you to see something. i got to get there myself, Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, is there a period after that? Okay. That's really important to see there. And it goes on. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. Period. Okay. Now, from anybody who has any amount of education, how can you go from verse 1 to verse 2? And that's where most people on January 1 go, oh, this is so hard, I don't get it. And that's why they get discouraged with Bible reading. All right? So here's the thing. If God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, okay, what was it like? Was it formless? How can that be created? Because we don't think in terms of that, and we do understand the word created. Well, he gave Isaiah, a prophet, a whole bunch of information. And part of the information was about this sentence. Go to Isaiah 45, 18, 20. Isaiah 18. Okay, and it says, For the Lord is God, and he created the heavens and earth. Good, we know that. That's confirmation of, of Genesis 1 1, right? Mm -hmm. Now look what it says there. And put everything in place. 
You see that? So that's not chaos. There's not things, it's not empty. He put everything in its place. Okay? It was not a place of empty chaos in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. It's like the Lord created things and he put things here and there and there. And everything's put in place. Susan, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering. Everything was put in place. Where, where is that? 4518. Oh, Isaiah. My Bible says this. What does yours say? Mine says, um, who has established it? Who has established it? That's uh, forming it and making it. It's forming. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's. Oh, who has established it is what it right, says. Right. What, um, what, um. New Kingdom. New Kingdom. Yes, okay. And establish something. If you establish a business, it's not chaos. An established business has a license to open and do business, okay? In other words, it has been established in the proper way that it is allowed to do business. And that's, so you have to look. Uh, Susan, you have to look at the word established and all that that brings with it. But it means properly done, put in its place. So what I'm establishing here is the fact that when God created the heavens and the earth, he didn't create any chaos. He didn't create it in void where everything was out of place. It was in place. Okay? All right. Now, we have to ask, how long did that first sentence of the Bible, Genesis 1, how long did it last? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. How long did that last? A year? A hundred years? Hundreds of years? Thousands? Millions? Billions? Trillions of years? The answer is we don't know. We don't exactly know. But what we do know is what was happening during that period. Okay? There was a mighty angelic being that was put in charge of earth for God. He acted as prophet, one who speaks for, priest, one who brings worship to, and king, one who has authority for God. He acted as prophet, priest, and king. The earth was his domain. So here's the earth. Here's the heavens. Okay? So here everything is orderly, which means it had creatures of some sort on it. Okay? We know that. And this particular, again, excuse my, my drawings, they're the worst, okay? This particular angel was in charge of everything on earth. And probably, to a certain extent, into the atmosphere is what I would suspect. This angel was such a top dog angel that you've got to understand that he never ever, in everything that he was in charge of, even when he would go back up to heaven, he never saw better than himself, ever. He was the wisest, the most beautiful, the most powerful creature. He never saw better than himself in creatures. The only time he saw better than himself was at the very throne of God where the creator was greater. Do you understand? Okay. And so he had, we understand in Ezekiel, he had access, he had access to the heavens and the earth. In other words, he could go back and forth. Okay? He had access. He could move back and forth. He needed to in order to get God's will, to come back down, to speak God's will as a prophet, to act as a king for the dominion of the earth. But he also went back up to what? Receive all the worship, right? And bring it back up to God. So he was really a busy guy or a busy angel, okay? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Unless, did I put it in your lesson? Did I, I don't see it. Let me see yeah, that lesson. Where are you? Here's it. Oh, well, no. How'd you get that? This is, these are my old notes from when I did it the first time. Okay. Let's go to Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> Verse 12. Just to the right a little bit. Okay. Let's look at what let's look at each verse right here and see what it says. I'm going to start with Ezekiel chapter 28. So this is another prophet, a Jewish prophet, whom uh,
God had given to the nation of Israel. And um, he gave, again, more information of the distant past, okay? It says, thus says the Lord, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Okay, so that establishes that fact. Look at verse 13. You were in Eden. Now, all of us know about the Garden of Eden, right? Mm -hmm. We think about Adam and Eve and the Garden, but that's not the same Eden going on. The Garden of God, not Adam's Garden. God's garden. Now it goes on to explain what God's garden looked like. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your temples and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So we've got this most magnificent being definitely of the angelic creation, and he's over this earth. What did this earth now just get described as? Well, it was described as the Garden of God, but all we see are minerals being described. I don't see, I'm not saying that there wasn't vegetation. I'm sure that there was vegetation, but the overwhelming picture of the earth at this point are all these beautiful, beautiful minerals. So it must have been that when you looked around and you saw the mountains, what did you see? You just saw all these minerals sparkling like crazy. Can you imagine? All right, go to verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God and you walked back and forth See that? They're sent back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Well, what are fiery stones? It's all the different order of the angels. Angels are often referred to as fiery beings, okay, and fiery stones. Verse 15, look at this. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until, underline that word, until, until iniquity or evil was found in you. Wow, there it is. So look at that. Verse 12, it's the sum of perfection. He was the most beautiful, most powerful, and the wisest 13. He was covered with precious stones. Oh, the temples and the pipes. He must have had, he must have been a being that had literally music of some sort coming out of him, which makes sense because worship includes music always. God is the one who created music. And so he must have brought, you know, the glory of God right down to earth with music and brought it back up. There was, it must have just been a magnificent creature, one we probably can't even imagine, okay? Surrounded with music. He was the anointed cherub. Verse 14 says anointed. Anointed always refers to and is a word using a priestly role. He was governed with power. And he was found blameless in 15. And with these roles, Lucifer received worship of the universe beneath him, offered it to the creator above him. And that means he had access to the very highest realm of heaven, the very throne of God. Now, again, you got to do with my, my art. I'm still not an artist, but I'm just going to, there's, there's the chair. <laughs> okay, there's the very, very throne of God where God sits. He had access to that. Remember, he never saw better than himself except where? At the throne of God. Now, how long did all of this last? Of this angel being in charge and all of this incredible beauty going on is what we've just read in Ezekiel. We don't know how many years it lasted. Verse 15, though, of Ezekiel gives us the answer. Until. It lasted until. <laughs> until the day evil was found. What? Ginger? My question in, in verse 12, it says, Son of man, sing this funeral song for the king of Tyre. Yes. So as, as a person reading this, how would I know that that was describing Prophetic. Satan? This is a prophecy. 
And prophecy often has uh, double meanings, sometimes triple meanings. It can be speaking exactly to that moment in time right there, but it also can be speaking to the distant past. It can be speaking to the distant future. Interestingly, I'm going to get into that more next week, but here's the thing about that. If you check out history, there is no king of Tyre or prince of Tyre. There never was. So it is referring to Satan. Okay, but again, that's a lot of Bible study, a lot sure. of training, and you just learn to understand okay. the nature of prophecy. Is this similar to how Pharaoh like represented Satan? Yeah. So the exactly. king of Tyre is yes. similar to that. Yeah, it would be. It's similar to okay. it, but it's not referring to Pharaoh. It's definitely sure. referring. Sure. But Pharaoh was a representation for Satan. sure of the evil one. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Okay. So <clears throat> how long it lasted was until until that's all we know. Mm. So what happened? Well, we've got to go on to verse 16 okay let's read 16 through 19 of ezekiel 28 16 it says your rich commerce led you i'm now in the nlt your rich commerce led you to violence and you sinned so i banished you in disgrace from the mountain of god I expelled you, O oh mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. What are the stones of fire? Angels. Angels. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. You defiled your sanctuaries with your many sins and your dishonest trades. So I brought fire out from within you and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All who knew you are appalled at your fate. You have come to a terrible end and you will, now that's future, you will exist no more. Isn't that interesting? Okay, now let's talk about that. Because now we go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. If you can flip back there, and it says, And the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. We just, a few minutes ago, established the fact that the earth wasn't created formless. Everything was put in its place. We read that in Isaiah chapter 45, which means that something happened between verse 1 of Genesis 1-1 one, one and verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. So you've got Genesis with the first sentence, and then you've got a period, and then it goes on to the second sentence. So do you realize that between that period and the beginning of that second sentence, there might have been millions or trillions of years? We don't know. But something definitely happened in between there. The lights went off, everything became empty, and chaos erupted. Now let me ask you something. Why is it today that I can't look out at the mountains and see all those beautiful, beautiful minerals that God talked about? Why can't I? Where are the minerals? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're deep inside. That's exactly right. Something big happened. Something huge exploded. Can I borrow this for a second? Yeah. Wow. This is the earth is perfect. <laughs> really had this. If this is the earth, look at it. The earth was made perfect and it was put in its place. And Satan attempted that hostile um, takeover, right? The lights went out and the earth shook. All the mountains erupted whatever and now all of those minerals are deep down inside the mountains where men have to go down and dig for minerals and mine them out they're all different now in how it is right but here's the other thing we know from science that we have found woolly mammoths those are the dinosaurs we've found remains of them intact like an ice age that happened so quickly that when they looked into it, they found in the digestive area of their being that there was undigested tropical plants. But they were found in the North Pole. Now we all know 
but there's no such thing as tropical plants in the North Pole, right? How could that have been? It means that there were tropical plants there at one time, don't, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? If this is the Earth, and if it's not tilted on its axis, but if it's straight, then guess what? The whole Earth would be tropical based on what, where the sun hits it. But if it's tilted on its axis, then all of a sudden we have all different types of weather in different areas where the sun hits, which produces a North Pole and a South Pole at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. You see, it was probably at this point when God didn't just shake the mountains, the whole earth tilted on its axis. Wow. You see that? And that's where, there you go, you put your feet back up there. <laughs> and that's where we see. So that's why I don't get into an argument with all these scientists, because you get along with Christians and they'll say, no, no, the earth is only 6,000 years old because of the Bible and the history of the Bible. Well, you know what, it, it, from where we've started recording, that very well may be true. But I don't have a problem if a scientist wants to say to me, I have proof in a dinosaur. There was some sort of creatures that were here that were suddenly, all of a sudden, fossilized by an ice age. And the lights went out. And we know that because the Bible says that. Do you see what I'm saying? So we can see all of that. We, we, we've got proof of it. Okay? And, all right, so are there any questions at this point on that? Before I go on, yes. Well, I was just going to say, last weekend, my husband and I um, were building a house, and we were picking out stone, and so we went to the natural stone place um, down in L.A., and we were in awe walking through there, like quartzite, and the natural big slabs yeah. of natural mineral, you know. Natural yeah, ground. what's and down I, under there? Yeah, and I was just in awe as yep. I was walking through going, yep. God made all, all of, of this. this. I know. You know, it wasn't too it's long ago so my husband and I moved, and we were gifted uh, a slab of, of granite for new countertops because the ones that were in the house were just, it was so bad and so old. And I did the same thing. I walked in to pick granite out, you know, and just to see all the beautiful colors and the slabs and what God has underneath all those mountains. That, that's yeah. all what happened. So when Satan, what Lucifer was in charge, the earth was a very, very mineral earth. Now the interesting thing is if you want to go to the end of the Bible and look at revelations about the new heaven and the new earth, guess what? It describes all of these jewels again sparkling. So I think that there's going to be in the new heaven and the new earth that's made, it's going to be a combination of the beautiful vegetative earth that we have today, which again, we know that there must have been vegetation also then, but it wasn't the main feature. The jewels were obviously the main feature of this mineral earth, but we can see a real combination in the end uh, of Revelation for what we're yet going to have in the future, okay? So you can dream about that a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, so did his name change from Lucifer to Satan? Are you gonna teach we, on that? I can I can talk about, was that what your question? I wanted to ask. Okay. Here's the real interesting thing. I don't usually go into it, but I will today, okay? We know him now as a fallen angel, correct? Mm -hmm. Satan, the devil, the dragon, Lucifer, they're not really names, they're all descriptions. See, which name carries with it all power and all authority? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. we know that. We always use the name Jesus, okay? And we know that. So names are important. Names carry with them a meaning and an authority. We Americans, we tend to get pregnant and think, oh my gosh, we get to pick out a name that's so exciting. And typically in our culture, we think in terms of the name or the sound that we like. Oh, I like this name. I like that name. In Hebrew culture, they always went with what it meant. That was the priority. It didn't matter how it sounded. The priority was what the parents were wanting to say, how they were wanting to relate that child to God if they were to receive a child, okay? Like, for instance, Elijah, okay? God is Yah. That is what that name means, or Yahweh. God is Yahweh. And that was a very godly couple in a day and age in the history of Israel in which all of Israel was saying, Baal is God. Baal is God. And so they got pregnant and they said, our son's name will declare the truth. So it didn't matter whether they liked the sound of Elijah. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So a name is very, very important, Hebraically speaking, or from God's point of view. So to answer the question, why do I tell you all of this? 
We don't really know what his original name was. His name was stripped because his name brought what? Authority. And that's one of the things that makes him very, very angry right now is that he doesn't have a name. All he has is a description, the evil one, Satan, Lucifer, Daystar. Okay? It really is more of a description. It's not really a name. We still know, though, we talked about in the last couple of weeks about angels. We know one of the highest angels' name. What was his name? You got it. His name has not been stripped. Who is like God? That's the name. What you see with him? Michael. Oh, yeah. You know, and Gabriel, and others, so, so there are other names, but his name, that was something that was also stripped from him when he was knocked down, okay? Does that answer? Yeah, because like you were saying, you said Lucifer, or first you said Satan, then you're, then you're like Lucifer. And we go by all of these different descriptions. Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Okay, good. All right, any other questions before I go on? Okay, good. So, what really happened now beyond this, all right? Into the universe arose another will, a will. And that is what created the very first moment in time, right here. That is when time began, right there, when Satan lunged at the very throne of God. Because now for the very first time ever, before there was always only one will in existence. Whose will was it? God's will. And, and this guy right here, he was, um, in a blameless way, he was carrying out God's will. Correct? Until, verse 15 says, until the day iniquity was found in your heart. There was a violence that he allowed to get into his heart. Violence is a hard word, isn't it? Listen, know this. The violence of rebellion comes with just the simplicity of saying, my will, I'll do it my way. It's just that simple. That is violence of rebellion. And so all of a sudden, when he thrusted at the throne of God, for the very first time, there were now in existence two wills. Now, let's just take a husband and a wife, for example, right? Or a dating couple, you're getting ready to date, right? You're so in love with each other, everything's great. And just everything you do, oh my gosh, yeah, let's do that. Oh my gosh, yeah, let's just do that. Oh yeah, okay, I totally would. Yes, yes. And comes a day when, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. No, I want to do this, right? And, and you've got two different wills. And what do you have? You've got some conflict for the very first time. You can't be together if one wants to go to a baseball game and the other wants to go for a hike and sit by a river. Right? It's a power struggle. It's a power struggle. That is what conflict is. Listen, do you want to know something? That is simply what time is, guys. That is what time is. Time is another word for conflict. That's all it is. That's why there will be the end of time. We'll get there in a second. So does it mean end of time is end of conflict? That's right. We're going to get there. <laughs> See, the period, you very smart. The period between eternity past and eternity future is a period called time, where exists more than one perfect will of God. Thus, there is conflict. And so Lucifer led an insurrection. He attempted a hostile take over with a five point I will strategy. Now at this point, uh, uh, Satan has a different will than God's will. And all of those angels, one third of them, right, are in line with whose will? His will, not God's will. So we'll say that there were two wills in existence. Now let's look at Satan's plan. It was a five point plan, a five point I will plan. So go to Isaiah chapter 14, Verses 12 through 14. Okay? Now, in the NLT version, I think you're only going to see actually written out in your print. I think you're only going to see three I wills. Uh, Isaiah 12, uh, 14. Okay? I think you're going to see in print in your Bibles only three I wills. But if you go back to the original Hebrew, transliterated, right, there's actually five. I wills said in the heart of Satan. So I'm going to read from more of the NKJV, okay? 
So uh, verse 12 of chapter 14, here's his plan. He says, I will ascend into heaven. Oh, what does that tell you? That he was on earth because what is ascending? It's going up, not coming down, correct? Mm -hmm. So he says, I will. So that's, that speaks of position. He demanded that the sphere of his rule be lifted from not just over earth, but he wanted to rule all of heaven as well as earth. Do you see that? Okay. The next... Oh, I will. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He probably was, even though he was the highest angel, it doesn't mean he had authority over all angels. There were probably some angels that answered maybe directly to God that he was not in charge of. There were probably angels on earth that he was in charge of, but he wanted to be in charge of what? Every single one of them. Okay? So that was power. The next I will, I will number three, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Now that's prominence. That says I want to be first. I desire of the position of governing from heaven. I have a position here of governing over earth. I want to sit right there. I want that position. Okay. All right. What about I? the next one? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now clouds in the Bible are a symbol of God's authority. Okay, glory and, and, and clouds are authority. They go together. And above this, he desired to climb, to be above God, perspective. And then his last I will was this. I will be like the most high God. And that has to do with a per person. Now think about it. Out of all of God's names, Satan chose to be like Yahweh Elihom. Yahweh, we know, we studied that word, Yahweh, sometimes translated Jehovah, but I want to stick with the Hebrew, Yahweh, that means God. But then there's a whole bunch of added phrases in the Bible after Yahweh that describes who God is, we talked about that. And one of the descriptions is El Elyon, or Elyon, something like that, okay? And do you know what it means? It means I am, Yahweh means I am, I am possessor of mm. heaven and earth. Mm. Or, in other words, I am owner mm. of heaven and earth. I will be like Yahweh El Elyon. I will be like God, the owner of heaven and earth. Now, I want you to notice something. I want you, in this whole picture... I want you to notice the direction of this five-point plan, the five I wills of God. It's upward every time. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit on the mount of congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like most every single one of them is straight up. Now, I want you to notice God's declaration in response to this failed coup. If you can go back to Isaiah. Are you in Isaiah 14? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me get there. Isaiah 14. Okay. Isaiah 14, 15, and 16. Look at this. By Isaiah 14, I will climb to the highest heavens, and I will be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Everyone there will stare at you and ask, can this be the one who shook the earth and made the kingdoms of the world tremble? Isn't that easy? That's God. It's a prophecy. Perfect. Isn't that incredible? And that is God's answer, you guys, to someone who thrusts themselves in an upward position. God says to those that push their way up, says you will be brought down. down. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what Jesus did. Go to the New Testament, to Philippians, please. Um, Philippians chapter 2. It's towards the back of the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians comes after the Gospels and Acts, Romans, First Corinthians, so Philippians. It's a small little book. Philippians chapter 2. This is talking about Jesus, starting at verse 6. Look at, look at what Jesus did. 
This is just, I'm giving you now the way that the kingdom of God operates. If you are a believer, and if you belong to Jesus, you need to understand your citizenship and what it entails and what it means, right? What is it like to live in the kingdom of God? And here's what Jesus did. Verse 6. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Remember, they're made a little lower than the angels. Mm -hmm. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Notice the difference of what Jesus, God, did. What was his position in the kingdom of God? What did he do? This was his direction. Down, 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 down. He kept going down. He didn't just get born a human. God put him on flesh? Let me explain. This is a terrible analogy. It's the best one I can come up with. But it's far from the reality. Say you go out today to the pet store and you buy a little tiny fish bowl, put water in it, and you buy a couple of goldfish. And they start fighting. And your kids are crying because they're going to kill each other. So you have the ability to put on fish scales and go and become a fish. And you go there and you say, listen, I know your problem. Your problem is sin, and that's why you're wanting to kill each other. I'm going to die for you. And as a fish, you died for them. Right? But then you resurrected back to where? Huh? Resurrected back to life, right? Do you get to go back to being what you were before? That's not what Jesus did. Do you realize that Jesus is a man forever? Jesus put on flesh, guys, forever. Let that sink in. Jesus is a man. He's God, but he put on flesh forever. And so now that fish has died, and God has brought the fish what? back to life. And now you are a fish <laughs> forever. Does that bring perspective yeah. in? Mm -hmm. Look at verse 7 in Philippians. What chapter? Oh, uh, chapter 2 of Philippians. He humbled himself, verse 8, in obedience to God. He died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, what I'm teaching you right now is... A principle of how the kingdom of God operates for those who want to be citizens in the kingdom of God. For those who thrust themselves up and try to grab upward, you will be brought low. But in the kingdom of God, God honors and lives by the spiritual law of gravity. And the law of gravity does what? It brings you down. It brings you down, and that's exactly it. Listen. All those, it says in the Gospels, that lift themselves up and exalt themselves will be humbled. But those who take the low position will be exalted. That's how we live as believers. We go low, and then we go lower. And then we go even lower. That's what Jesus did. He just kept going lower and lower and lower and lower. You see, God wants to bless us. But God cannot bless People. It's against his character to bless people if it goes against the nature of who he is. And so, therefore, he cannot bless pride. He just can't. And pride is in us all. It is the root of all sin. That's what happened to Lucifer. Pride got in. Pride said, I will. I will. You see what pride does? Pride puts you up. The Lord wants to fill his people with his presence, but how can he fill anyone who's already filled with himself? We have to empty ourselves of pride. And so you think of pride as, well, I'm all that. Listen, that's not the only type of pride there is. 
I'm just not worthy. I'm just, I don't know, I'm just so bad. I'm just not worthy. Listen, don't fool yourselves. That is false humility. That's called inverted pride. Why is that inverted pride? Because you're still focused on self. And this creature got his eyes off the creator, and he got his eyes on who? Himself. And that's going to be the problem every time. When you're so focused on self, you're going to be stumped. You're not going to grow. You're not going to be blessed. It's not so much what's happening to you. It's about him. That's the key in living in this kingdom. It's totally the key. And so that's exactly what happened. And so the very first moment in time out of eternity past where we live was when Satan exercised his will. Now think about it. God could have, when he did that, God could have destroyed him instantly. Why didn't he? Why didn't God just, I am done with you, dude. You're over and done with. Listen, if God would have chosen this course of action, he could have not ever created another being as high and as wonderful as Lucifer, seated as the governor of the universe, possessing the gift of will and of choice, free will, I should say, and free choice, without seeing this same rebellion occur over and over over and over again. This absence of striking Satan down was a very merciful act on God's part. God chose instead to give this rebel uh, the full opportunity of exploiting every single avenue of his power and his wisdom to demonstrate to the rest of the cre creation, visible and invisible, that nothing good could ever come apart from that which originates in God's one will. That's why God didn't strike him down. There's all these different possibilities. This rhyme represents from the first moment in time to the very end moment in time. Whenever that is, God knows that. And this, this line is, is all of man and all of Satan trying to go here. And go here, get off the line, get off the line, get off the truth, get off the truth. I'll try this, 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 I'll try this. This is, and every single attempt comes to a dead end. Nothing comes to a good end. The only end that will come to good is what? What stays on the line of truth, which is God's one will perfectly. And so it is wonderful what God is doing right now. It's merciful. Nothing good will come to an end. You might as well not try to save the United States of America. It's trying to do things outside of God's perfect will. So of course it's going to be a demonstration to all of creation, visible and invisible. Now, it seems like, oh, this is just really, really bad right now, at least for us. But here's a really little bit of good news, okay? And it's this. That in Romans 13, chapter 1, God has set a limit to this power, okay? It says the powers that, are, that be right now, the powers that be during time, okay, are ordained by God. In other words... There will be strict guidelines for the universe during this period of which we call time. All that Satan has done or will do is by the permissive will of God. He is on the throne. Do not doubt it. And he is in charge of everything. Go to Isaiah 45, verse 7. I'm going to show you something that's going to kind of blow you away, but you need to know this. Isaiah 45, verse 7. Isaiah was given more information about God and what he does and who he is and how he acts. Remember, his ways are so much higher than our ways and his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. But here he says in verse 40, or chapter 45, verse 7, starting in verse 6, actually, it says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Okay, we've got that. We know that. Verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. 
I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, we got to deal with that. Now, I just read you out of the New King James Version, that verse. And I know the NLT doesn't read quite like that, okay? But that is how it says in the Hebrew, I create Ra. I don't know the Hebrew word for create, but the Hebrew word for evil is Ra. I create evil. Now, what in the world does that mean? Listen, God is not the author of sin. Sin originated in the heart of of the evil one and remember never think that evil is abstract evil is personal evil is a person and evil began in the heart of this creature right here but the consequences of evil or the sequence of events that follows rebellion that has gotten in the heart god is in control of and he makes it look a certain way think about it there was the violence of rebellion in his heart, which was evil. He is the evil one. He thrust at the very throne of God. What did God do? God created the consequences of what was in his heart. What were the consequences? Chaos, judgment, the lights went off. He became a disembodied spirit along with the third of the angels that follow him. God is in charge. He is on the throne. And he gets to say the consequences of what evil is going to look like. It's the law of planting and harvesting. You go to Home Depot this afternoon and say, I want to buy carrot seeds because I want carrots. You're going to go, you're going to buy carrot seeds, you're going to plant them, and eventually what are you going to get? Carrots. You're going to get carrots. Okay? You want to plant evil? You're going to harvest consequences. Mm -hmm. And who's in charge of those consequences? God. He gets to say, that's the problem with man. He is, well, if there is a God, so what? I get a free will. I can choose whatever I want. Yes, you can. That's right. You get to choose whatever you want. But what you don't realize is that actually you have relative free will. Because you can choose to say no thank you to the greatest need you have, a Savior, to deal with your sin. And you can say no thank you. But what you're not in charge of is being powerful enough to determine what happens when you take your last breath. The consequences of your choice are going to be determined by your creator, God, most high. Possessor, owner of what? Heaven and earth and all that is in it. We are creations. And isn't it just like man's pride to think he is his own God? No, I'm in charge. You see that? And that is what you've got to get understood. You have to understand that. Listen, the word of God, he is a word. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. And the word is one of construction as well as destruction. God can destroy. God can create. He creates in us brand new beings. We belong to him. We're no longer under the, the consequence of destruction because of original sin. We are now under a whole different law, right? Because we've lowered, we've humbled ourselves and said, I am a sinner. Lord, I need you. I need you to do something for me. Now we're exalted and we're created. And now we're in a, a work becoming like him. And so even though God created the universe and everything in, in it, okay, he is not the author or the source of sin. And so he is not to be held responsible for it. Listen, sin originated. Here's the beginning of sin in the angelic world with Satan. But then... That angelic being was represented in the Garden of Eden by a serpent. And then in man, it originated in Adam. So original sin did originate in Adam. He was a whole different creation. Adam was not an angel. He was a what? He was a man. And he in and of himself shows with the same violence of rebellion that entered into his heart, he chose that. And that is what sin is. And what happens then? There's a consequence for it. And that's what I'm saying. When I say God creates evil, I'm saying that he's in charge of the consequences or the sequences of events that look and, and act and follow and harvest from evil, from rebellion. Okay? You understand that? And so... Um, 
I, I want you to very clearly understand that. Um, Yahweh, he is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He knew everything. He knew what was going to happen. So when Lucifer attempted this hostile takeover, God was not astonished by this outbreak. Satan works within the limits of God's eternal plan. See, this whole strategy, including what is yet to come in the form of man, because we haven't even gotten to man yet, it all takes place in just a single moment, maybe even from God's point of view, a single breath called time that is sandwiched in between two eternities, eternity past and eternity future. Remember, from God's point of view, this whole thing, you remember this, right? Time. It just seems like it's going on so long, right? That's even a bit. It's like a little, a little wisp of a breath, a vapor in between two eternities. Okay? And so God has a plan in all of this. And it's a merciful plan. And it's being carried out. And let all creation, visible and invisible, watch this battle during this brief interlude between eternity past and eternity future that is called time. The spirit of independence outside of God's will shall be allowed to expand to its utmost. Again, the wreck and the ruin which shall result from the very smallest of life to the largest of life and expand to the... Listen, it's going to demonstrate to the whole entire universe forever and ever and ever and ever that, that there is no life, there is no joy, and there is no peace apart from complete dependence upon God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. That's the only possibility to ever have true life, true joy, and true peace. And right now, this is a time that that is being demonstrated. He's allowing the lesson to be learned. Now, in the future, the universe is going to get back to eternity. It's going to get back there. There shall be no more time because there shall be no more deviation from the will of God. God. Thus, those of us in whom God plants eternal life are made partakers of the divine nature. And we get to also escape the corruption of wanting one's own way. And therefore, because we have the divine nature planted in us, we will be able to say along with Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done. That's why in the future, when time is no longer, that's why there has to be a new heaven and a new earth. Because the heaven and the earth now has been polluted by what? Other wills that bring a dead end at every single point. And so God's going to make a brand new one. And I've had people ask me, well, is there ever going to be a point that in the new heaven and the new earth when we're there, we're going to maybe be tempted to want to do our own will? No, we won't. Not because we're robots, but because we've lived and we've seen there is no other joy. There's no other peace. There's no other victory except living in whose will. God, we're going to be totally dependent upon him. So the violence of rebellion that I'm talking about, I want to give you something very important here that I want you to know. I want you to know this for your children as you raise them, okay? Because I'm, we're, we're going to bring Satan right down to the point of a little child, a little tiny child who knows none of this nor could even comprehend what I've just said. The shortest definition of violent sin the shortest definition of terrible violence, of terrible rebellion, is this. Did, did your daughter say that to you ever? Sure, we all have. My grandchildren are saying that to their mother right now. We all have. It's the violence of rebellion. That is the very shortest definition of sin, and that is the same part that Satan said when he got ready to take over. I will is a will saying, not you, God, me, even out of your little children, even out of my grandchildren. That's all that is. So then, if that is the shortest definition of sin, what is the shortest definition of obedience? I will. 
There it is, right there. Listen, when I say, I will, you are in partnership with Satan. When you say, thy will, you are in partnership with the Lord. And this is why the greatest gift that you can give to little children is require obedience. And understand, when they say, no, I will do this, you don't even go there. Because what you are doing with little children is you are giving them the greatest gift of obedience because that is faith. It is saying, thy will. And that's what's not happening anymore today in this country. And that's why we are in part where we are today. Because we have parents that don't want to fight with their children. My daughter right. uh, was raising my grandchildren. She goes, I just can't believe how bad it is. And, of course, she talks to other people. And guess what other people say to her? Oh, you know, he's just really smart. And, you know, he probably has some ADD. You know, he can't help it. Go roar. <laughs> right? And I said, now, Megan, you're understanding how very, very bad our nature is. Original sin with which we're born with. She was a little girl. I had to fight with her, and she grew up. And she became a young adult that thought she knew everything. Typical. And then, see, that's why God has young people get married and have babies because then they get to see some things. It's not so much for paybacks. What it is is it's so we can realize this is us. Mm -hmm. This is us. And now that's why you have to be tough and you've got to raise it. It's the greatest gift I've ever had. I was raised in a really strict home and I am so thankful for it. Don't ever back down. And it will be a war. Don't you ever back down. You're giving them the greatest gift because Faith is linked with obedience. Do you think Jesus wanted to go to the cross? He sat in the garden of Gethsemane and he said, no, no, I don't want to. Please, if there's any way that I cannot do this, please, no. And his father said, no, you go and you stay. And ultimately, Jesus in the garden said, thy will be done. Does that mean that Jesus all of a sudden felt happy about going to the cross? Oh, okay, yeah, it's going to be fine. No! It was with great fear. And that's why he cried out on the cross, My God! My God! Why have you rejected me? But it was for a good thing. It was for us. And that is exactly what you've got to know. Listen, we are fighting against the wills. And the spirit of darkness is even greater over this country now because we are now a country that has shut God out. And so we no longer want you. And so God has said, okay. And that is why our kids are feeling it. And it's going to even be a greater fight for you with your children than it was for me with mine. Or, and I had a tougher time with mine than my parents did with me and my brothers. It will be a battle. Satan wants your kids. Why? Because he knows he is an eternally judged, doomed creature. He knows it. And he's going to pull as many down with. And that's why you're going to need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to fight yeah. all the very way. Okay? And so, ending this, we see this judged, malignant creature growing, groping in the dark. He's growing in malignancy, roaming in the midst of a destroyed creation. One that he considered his, of course, even though it's dark. He's left there, impotent, disembodied, and he knows it. And so with this darkened, sinister mind, he's brooding. And you know what happens? A hatred is developing in epic proportion toward God. A hatred is growing and growing and growing. Yet in this darkness, we also see God is brooding. He's brooding as well, a thought. And it's one of love. I'm going to do this, and then I'll do this, and then that will happen. Okay. All right. So, any questions on any of that? No. Okay. Oh. <laughs>
Okay, good. I'm, I'm just so thankful we got through. And you're so entertaining so too. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, you know what? This was the Lord because we started pretty late. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to hold him with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. You know, he stopped the clock so many times. This is one of those lessons that you just you can't really split up. Mm -hmm. You just can't. So good. So anyways, yeah, we'll continue on then next week with the story of what happens next.